Good? Okay. So we are walking step by step through the feast days. We've been through Passover and unleavened bread. So tonight we're looking at the third feast, which is the Feast of First Fruits. Now, this always happens to me in my classes. I'll teach a class and I'll go home later and I'll think, oh, I forgot to mention this or I forgot to mention this. So one thing we didn't talk about last week that I definitely want to point out is Passover and unleavened bread. We've looked at all of the details, how the, the Passover lamb points to Jesus on the cross, how the unleavened bread represents his sinless life and also his, his body in the tomb as he was striped and pierced. Um, but looking at Jesus, one other significant detail is that he was born in Bethlehem. Does anybody know what Bethlehem means in Hebrew? House of bread, House of bread right? So in Bethlehem, um, house of bread, that would be the location where the shepherds would raise the lambs that would be transferred to the temple for the Passover sacrifices. So in Bethlehem, you have the Passover lambs being raised and you have the house of bread where the bread of life was born. So that kind of unifies those two feast themes together in, in Bethlehem. So I, I thought that was another little nugget that we needed to acknowledge. So tonight is good news, right? We've been looking at the, 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 the lamb on the cross. We've been looking at the crucifixion. We've been looking at the death of Christ. Tonight, we're looking at the resurrection of Christ. So the third day after Passover is the Feast of first fruits, And so we're going to be walking through that detail by detail tonight. So we'll begin where we have been beginning in Leviticus 23, the concise chapter that details all seven feasts. It doesn't give us all the details of the feasts, uh, but it gives us kind of an overview. So let's review the day of first fruits. So Leviticus 23, we need someone to read verses 9 through 14. Verses 9 through 14. Who's our first reader tonight? Okay, thanks, Bill. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, Come into the land which I give to you and reap its harvest, and you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted on your behalf. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it, and you shall offer on that day, when you wave the sheaf, a male lamb of the first year, without blemish as a burnt offering to the Lord. Its grain offerings shall, offerings shall be two-tenths of an epa, epa, <coughs> of fine flour mixed with oil and offerings made by fire to the Lord for a sweet aroma. And its drink offerings shall be of wine, one-fourth of a hen. You shall eat neither bread nor parched grain nor fresh grain until the same day that you have brought an offering to your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. Okay, so that's the description of the day of first fruits. But back in verse 10, it specifically tells the Israelites where they are to celebrate this. Um, in what location would the Israelites first, the first time they celebrate it, where would they be when they brought the offering of first fruits to the priest? In their land, right? It says, when you become into the land which I give unto you. So their instructions are for when they enter into the land, they're to celebrate this feast. So we saw Passover, we saw unleavened bread develop very quickly together in Exodus. Um, we will see how it's related to first fruits in Exodus, but this feast was projected for when they come into the promised land. So we'll be looking at that story tonight. Um, what specific day was the feast of first fruits to occur? After the Sabbath. After the Sabbath, right? Which would have been the day of unleavened bread. We know that unleavened bread is a seven day feast. On the first day there was a Sabbath and on the seventh day there was a Sabbath. So it begins with Passover on the 14th of Nisan, the 14th day of the first month. The very next day at evening starts the day of unleavened bread. And then the day after the Sabbath, which would be the third day since Passover, they're to celebrate the first fruits. Now third day is important. We're going to be talking about the third day all night tonight. We know what happens on the third day. It's a good day. 
Um, so the specific date on the calendar, if Passover was 14th, then first fruits is the 17th. Are we on? Can you hear okay? Okay. Um, so after Passover, it's three days after Passover. 14th day is for Passover. The 17th of Nisan is the day of first fruits. Now, what type of offerings were they instructed to bring? <coughs> what was that? The first sheaf of the grain, right? So grab a sheaf of the first fruits. And generally this was barley. This is early in the spring. So the earliest harvest would have been the grain harvest of barley. We're going to look at how Pentecost is related to wheat. But first fruits, the sheaf that was offered was probably a barley harvest. And then also they brought a, a, a grain offering. They offered a lamb. They had a wine lib libation. But focus on the fact that they would gather the first fruits, a sheaf of barley, and they would give it to the priest, and he would present it as a wave offering before the Lord. So he just stood there and, and basically celebrated the harvest and waved it before the Lord. Um, the grain offering that they were to, to give, did it contain leaven? No, they're still in the context of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, right? So they don't have any leaven for seven days, and that includes the Day of First Fruits. So their grain offering, the flour and the oil, would not have leaven with it. Could they partake of the harvest themselves before they presented this wave sheaf? No, they had to wait, uh, and it was very ceremonial. They would gather the sheaf, they would bring it to the priest, they would have their celebration and their offering, and then they were allowed to feast after that. Um, so let's go to the first time they officially um, celebrate this holiday. Joshua chapter <coughs> 5. I'm not sure you could call this an official celebration because they didn't have the... <coughs> The, the temple yet, but they're in the eve on, on just the edge of entering into the promised land. So Joshua chapter 5, they've been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. They're moving closer and closer to the land, and this is just before the time they go in and they take Jericho. That's what we're going to be reading about. So Joshua chapter 5, Mark verses 1 through 9. Would someone please read verses 1 through 9? Anybody there? Now when all the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all the Canaanite kings along the coast heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan before the Israelites until we had crossed over, their hearts melted and they no longer had the courage to face the Israelites. At that time the Lord said to Joshua, Make flint knives and circumcise the Israelites again. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the Israelites at Gibeah Meraloth. Now this is why he did so. All those who came out of Egypt, all the men of military age, died in the desert on the way after leaving Egypt. All the people that came out had been circumcised, but all the people born in the desert during the journey from Egypt had not. The Israelites had moved about in the desert 40 years until all the men who were of military age, when they had left Egypt, had died, since they had not obeyed the Lord. For the Lord had sworn to them that they would not see the land that he had solemnly promised their fathers to give us, a land flowing with milk and honey. So he raised up their sons in their place, and these were the ones Joshua circumcised. They were still uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. And after the whole nation had been circumcised, they remained where they were in camp until they were healed. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. So this, the place has been called Gilgal to this day. Okay, thanks for reading. So they're just about to take over the promised land. This is again just before the conquest of Jericho and they have a little task to take care of. Just before entering the promised land, what does Joshua do with all of the males? He circumcises them, right? So <laughs> he circumcises the men. Um, the place is named Gilgal after what is said there in verse 9. And I really don't want you to miss this detail. It's a very important detail. Um, what did the Lord do with the reproach of Egypt? Rolled it away. He rolled it away. Okay, so rolled it away. The name Gilgal, here's what it looks like in Hebrew. If you'll remember, Hebrew is read from right to left. This is the Hebrew letter Gimel, Lamed, Gimel, Lamed. Okay, so it says Gilgal. It's kind of like G-L-G-L. -G -L. 
Gilgal. There's no vowels written. Sometimes the vowels are pointed above and below the letters, but these are just the consonants of that word. So this is actually a play on the word galal. This is the word galal in Hebrew, gimel, lamed, lamed, again with no vowels. So Gilgal sounds a lot like the Hebrew word galal. Galal means rolled away. So the Israelites had been wandering in the desert for 40 years. They had not been circumcised while they're in the desert, but before they enter the promised land, this is a necessary thing. This is a covenant that God gave to Abraham to keep with all of his male descendants. So the males are circumcised and they name the place Gilgal because the Lord rolls away the reproach of Egypt. That's gonna be a really significant detail as we relate it to the work of Christ. So remember the name Gilgal, Re remember the word Galal. You can even hear this word in Megillah. Megillah basically is a scroll in Hebrew and a scroll is something that you unroll. Um, Hebrew words have three letter consonant roots and a lot of times if they have the same consonants they're related so in Megillah you have um, a similar related root there let's continue reading in this story um, a short passage here but a good one would someone pick up with verses 10 through 12 okay Tamla while the people of Israel were encamped in Gilgal they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month in the evening on the plains of Jericho and the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate of the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. And then one more verse. And the manna ceased the day after they ate of the produce of the land, and there was no longer manna for the people of Israel, but they ate the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. Okay, so this is a very significant event. So let's go back and look at this three-day pattern. This matches up with our feast days. On what day did it say that the children of Israel kept the Passover? That was verse 10. What did it say? The 14th day of the month. The 14th day of the month. So this is 14th day of Nisan. This is Passover. So they kept the Passover after they had been circumcised. They keep the Passover again just before the conquest of Jericho. The very next day after Passover, what does it say that they did? They ate their unleavened cakes, and in the King James Version, it says they ate the old corn of the land. Um, so they're having their unleavened bread on the first day of unleavened bread. So they're following the feast days at this point. Then we come to the third day and something very significant happens. We know the third day is prescribed to be the first fruits when they enter the land. But what stopped on the day of first fruits? The manna. the manna from heaven. That ceases, and then they go into the promised land, and that year they had the first fruits of Canaan. They had the first fruits from the promised land. So they celebrate the Passover, they eat their unleavened bread, and then on the day of first fruits, the manna stopped. It no longer was evident when uh, they woke up. Remember, they went out and collected it from the ground. It looked like, um, I always think of it like little droplets of snow. Just they would gather the grain um, and they would make their cakes with that. That stopped on the day of first fruits. Now let's continue reading. It gets <coughs> even more exciting. Uh, verse 13 to the end of the chapter. That's 13 to 15. Willow, read really loud, okay? Make sure you're in chapter 5, babe. I think you're in 6. Yeah. 13, right? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Now, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn, with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied. But as a commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you, you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Okay, good job. Um, so Joshua has sees this mighty warrior, and he calls him a captain. Who is this captain? Any idea? 
Right. This is the captain of the host. Um, what does he tell Joshua to do? Take off his shoes. Has, ha, can you think of an example in the Old Testament where? Yes, the burning bush, right? So God tells Moses to take off his shoes. Why was he supposed to take off his shoes? Because he was standing on holy ground. And other times in the Bible when there was an angel visitor, just a, a messenger of God, an angelic visitor, a lot of times the earthly person would want to react by worshiping the angel, but the angel always says, no, no, don't fall down and worship me. Worship God. I'm your fellow servant. We know that happens in the book of Revelation. But this particular messenger, this angel, accepts Joshua's worship. It says Joshua falls face down and he takes off his shoes because he's standing on holy ground. So this mighty captain has a drawn sword, uh, a drawn sword. Um, and he is referred to as the captain of the host. So it's quite an amazing series of events here. We want to think about the pattern that's happening here. The reproach of Egypt was rolled away by the act of circumcision. And of course, a circumcision is a cutting of the male flesh. I've always wondered why that's only with the male descendants of Abraham. Why did God only make this type of covenant with the male descendants? It's simply because Jesus represents the male in the marriage between himself and the bride. Jesus is the one that suffered the cutting or the circumcision of the cross, the, the destruction of the flesh on the cross. This was something that the bride benefited from, but she did not participate in. So here we see the males being circumcised. They celebrate the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then on the day of first fruits, the manna ceases. And then Joshua sees the captain of the host with his sword drawn, and he tells him, take off your shoes because you're standing on holy ground, which means this visitor must have been uh, a pre-incarnate Jesus or um, God himself in the flesh somehow appearing to Joshua because this was an extremely important moment in history. Israel was about to take over the promised land. Um, and all of this is amazing, and it's certainly beautiful in its time, but it's pointing forward to something even more beautiful. It's just a, a precursor or a foreshadow of Jesus and the work that he did on the cross and in unleavened bread and first fruits. Hebrews 2.10 gives us another clue. It says, For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. So Joshua sees this mighty captain. He's there as uh, the leader into the promised land. And Jesus is called the captain of our salvation. So those are the pattern of events just before they enter into the promised land. Now we're going to fast forward to the New Testament and we're going to look at how is the day of first fruits fulfilled in the work of Jesus. So let's flip to Luke 24. Luke 24. This passage is told in uh, the different gospels. And so we get different details from different gospels. So we're just picking one. We're looking at Luke 24. And we're going to read verses 1 through 9. Luke 24, verses 1 through 9. Anyone ready? Okay, thank you, sir. Robert? It was on the first day of the week. <clears throat> At early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. <coughs> and as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He who is not here, he who is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified on the third day, rise. And he, they remembered his words when returning from the tomb. They told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. 
routine? Yeah, you're good. Thank you. All right, so this is really, really good news, right? Before Jesus was crucified, he did describe to his disciples, he says, I'm leaving, I'm going away, you're not going to see me for a little while. So he told them ahead of time what was going to happen, but they didn't fully understand the extent to which he would suffer, that he would be murdered by his enemies on the cross, and they didn't really even, couldn't conceive of the resurrection. Um, but the angel reminds them of what he said. And when the angel reminds them, they remember Jesus' words, and then they understand what had happened. So let's look at the timing. When did the women go to the tomb with the spices? The first day of the week, which was the third day since the crucifixion, right? The first day of the week. What time did they go? early in the morning so early on the third day early on the third day the third day since passover would have been the 17th of nisan so we're looking at the day of first fruits so early on the third day early on the day of first fruits they go to the tomb with spices so this was the day of first fruits so jesus rose from the dead he came out of that tomb the stone rolled away and he came out alive resurrected as the firstborn from among the dead. Now I was thinking about this, how the timing of everything is so precise and so exact and so amazing that for these events to happen on these holidays that the Israelites had been rehearsing for many, many, many years up to Jesus, you know they would consider it significant and they would remember it. It's like if something major, some major event happens on your birthday, right? You remember that. Um, my dad's mom, whenever he was born on his birthday, she um, was in a car wreck and had to be rushed to the hospital to have a baby. So she goes to have uh, her baby. It was her birthday that she had this wreck. She has a baby. When she gets there, she finds out she's having another baby. So she had twins on her birthday. You know, it's something major happening on a significant day. It would always be memorable. So before the crucifixion, before the Jesus in the tomb, before his resurrection, God planned these events in advance. He could see the future. He knew it was going to happen. So he gave these feast days as a gift and as a witness to the nation of Israel to the work that Jesus would do. He gave them Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits, not for just their holidays, but because it would point them to the work of his son. He is the focus of all scripture. We have the blessing of hindsight. We can go back and we can pick out these details. Um, as we were talking last week, this was hard for them to understand at the time that it was happening. But we can go back and we can match up details. We can say, well, look at the hyssop and the hyssop. And, and here in a minute, we're going to be talking about this stone rolled away and how significant that is. But on the day of first fruits, Jesus rose from the dead. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 15. You should read the whole chapter for homework. It's amazing chapter verses 20 to 23 but now is christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept remember last week uh, paul told us that jesus was the passover lamb we understand he's the unleavened bread now he's saying jesus is the first fruits he's the complete meal he's the the perfect meal for your soul he's the passover lamb he is the unleavened bread and he is the first fruits for since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in, as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive, but every man in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are his at his coming. Remember, Paul was a Pharisee, so he knew the law. He practiced it perfectly, of course, before his conversion and his understanding of who Jesus was. So he knew exactly what the Passover meant, what unleavened bread pointed to. So he very clearly says, Jesus is the first fruits. That particular passage talks about, as in Adam, all men die, but as in Jesus, they're all made alive. I think it's really interesting in another gospel, when Mary sees Jesus, um, she doesn't recognize him. She doesn't realize it's Jesus. And it says, she thought he was the gardener. You remember that part? She sees this man, it's Jesus, she does, but she thinks he's the gardener. If you think about who the original gardener was, the first man, Adam, and all of the things that, that Jesus went through 
picking up Adam's punishment. We've talked about the thorns. We've talked about the sweat from his brow in the ground, like Adam's punishment. Um, we've talked about Adam's nakedness, that Jesus had to bear that shame on the cross. But then he gets out of the tomb, glorious, and Mary thought he was the gardener. I th you know, why is that detail recorded? It's just absolutely beautiful. So let's talk about the stone. What happened to the stone that sealed the tomb of Jesus? It rolled away, it rolled away right? The stone was rolled away. Now, do we know the name of the hill where Jesus was crucified? Golgotha, Golgotha right? Golgotha. Um, John 19, 17, it's called the place of a skull or in Hebrew, Golgotha. Can you hear the G-L-G -G in there? You can hear that linguistic connection to Gilgal and Galal. So recall from the book of Joshua, the reproach of Egypt was rolled away, Galal, at Gilgal. Notice the connection between these words and the Greek word Golgotha, right? So you can see, here's Greek. The only reason I know Greek letters is because I teach math and we use them in trigonometry. <laughs> I don't know Greek as well as I know Hebrew, not that I know Hebrew that well. But this says Golgotha, so you have the uppercase gamma. This is Lamed, kind of looks like my gimel, but don't, don't worry about that. And here's your lowercase gamma. So you can see the same roots of the word there. So Galal rolled away, Golgotha, where the stone was rolled away, um, the hill of the skull. So that connects the rolling away of the reproach of Egypt to the rolling away of this stone. When Jesus stepped out of the tomb, he had a new resurrected spiritual body um, that was better than his earthly body. The, the reproach of the sin that he bore in his flesh on the cross for us was rolled away and he stepped out as um, uh, a new body, something that would never perish and live forever as the first fruits on the day of first fruits. Now, just as a little side note here, we're looking at the place of the skull and we're looking at this word Golgotha. If you go back to David and Goliath, whenever David defeats Goliath, what does he <laughs> defeat him with? A stone. He got the stone from the river, so that stone was not cut out with, with human hands. And he pegs him in the forehead, and Goliath falls, and then he draws his sword, and he cuts off his head. Well, later in the Bible, it says that he retrieves that head as a trophy, and he carries it to Jerusalem. So it doesn't give the specific location that he takes Goliath's skull to Jerusalem, but many say it, the reason that it was called Golgotha, the place of the skull, is because it was the place where Goliath's head was that, that David carried there. So even if you look at Goliath of Gath and you permute those letters, Golgotha is a permutation of Goliath of Gath. You can hear all of that linguistic connection. I love all of the etymology in the Bible and, and the play on words. It's absolutely amazing. So all of that is in play there. Tamla? Shannon, in the story of um, David and Goliath, when Goliath falls, he's hit with a stone hard enough to sink into his forehead. Mm -hmm. And you'd think the force of it would make him fall backwards. Mm -hmm. But the Bible says he fell on his face. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's hmm, symbolic? That is, that is amazing. Um, I would just say um, practically because he's rushing at David. Mm -hmm. And so he, it knocks him out and he, he has momentum forward. But um, you could probably see it as submission to... To David's victory possibly but it is that in itself also is a prefigure of defeating the Antichrist if you think about the Antichrist and he marks his followers on the right hand or the forehead um, the fact that the the stone hit his forehead I think is looking at that and eventually he will be defeated by Christ and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that, that Jesus is Lord and, and pay him honor. So it could be a picture of, of, of the honor that's due there, absolutely. Yeah, but that's interesting. So it's amazing, I love it. I can't get enough of it. 
So how did the angelic witnesses describe the events that had just transpired? What did he say? Let's look specifically at verse 7. So still in Luke 24, verse 7, what does the angel say? That's right. The Son of Man, he's going to be delivered into the hands of a sinful man, crucified, and the third day rise again. The third day is significant, not just on this day. This is the most important third day. But throughout the Bible, when you're reading and you, 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 you read that time clue, the third day is mentioned a lot. Um, in that culture, the third day kind of means the day after tomorrow. So I'll see you the third day. But that phrase, third day, is used throughout the Bible in significant events. So if you remember that the third day is connected to Jesus' resurrection on first fruits, when you're reading the third day in other stories, stop and think, what's this telling me about Jesus? It's telling me something important. In some way, there's a glimmer of light here pointing to Jesus. Um, but the angel describes what has happened. He is not here. He is risen. Psalm 1610 talks of this says, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. So Jesus was not left in the tomb. He was resurrected by God the Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, and he lives. He did not see corruption. We know that's true because he did not have sin. He was the unleavened bread. He was not corrupt. Um, but he wasn't left there. He rose again. Colossians 1.18 he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from among the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So he's the firstfruits, he's the firstborn, he is the head of the body. Recall on the day of firstfruits, according to Leviticus 23, the priest was to present a sheaf of firstfruits by waving it before the Lord. A sheaf is a bundle of grain stalks. We know that Jesus himself, he is called the first fruits. But there was another important event that happened on this day when Jesus came out of the tomb. And we can read about that in Matthew 27, another passage that describes the cross. It says, And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. So when Jesus came out of the tomb, um, others followed, right? It says the graves broke open, the saints came out, they went into the city, and they appeared to many. To me, it looks like a wave of first fruits, right? It's a sheaf of grain being presented before the Lord. Jesus has the preeminence in everything, He is the first fruits, but there was also a bundle that came out of the grave with him, just like the, the sheaf of first fruits was waved before the Lord. Um, so that's, that's really, really amazing. So God had this planned from the beginning, um, from the very beginning. He knew the feast days. He separated the nation of Israel. He separated out Abraham and he gave them um, through Moses these feast days because he had it planned out all along and he wanted his people to understand. So he made them have these holy days that they would celebrate in Jerusalem with their families, with the priests, so that they would understand the significance of all of these events. Uh, but God had this in mind from the beginning. The seven days of creation are detailed in Genesis 1 and 2. This narrative is incredibly simple that a child can understand it. In fact, that may have been what you first learned about God, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and then each day he made something, right? And you've, you've learned that since your youth. It's very, very simple. Yet what's said in Genesis 1 and 2 is so deeply complex that it has challenged theologians over the millennia. A child can understand it, yet it is so incredibly deep and complex when you take it apart that it's absolutely astounding. The pattern of the, the creation days is hidden and tucked away within all of Scripture, including within the feast days. God's purpose in all of human history is to highlight the work of His Son. Um, in fact, the first letter of the Bible is Bain, Ben, hold on, like this, no, 
Hold on, I'm having a memory lapse. There we go. So it's a B, Bain, and the last letter of the Bible, and it wouldn't be in Hebrew, the last letter of the Bible is the Greek New. So this is Hebrew Bain, this is Greek New, looks like our N. In Hebrew, together, what does Ben mean? Does anybody know? Sun. Sun. Okay, so the first letter of the Bible and the last letter of the Bible, if you put those together, I know they're from different languages, but you get the idea of Ben, Sun. The entire purpose of the Bible and all of human history is for us to learn about Jesus, the Son, the second person of, of the Trinity. I learned that from Kathy Lee Gifford's book. She wrote a book, um, The Rabbi, The Road, and has anyone read that? Can you remember what it's called? Anyway, I thought that was so cool. It's all about Jesus. <clears throat> so the account of creation is not independent of Jesus. So think about Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, um, and then he goes on day by day to create something new every day. How does God create in Genesis? What does he do? So speaks. He speaks, right? He says, let there be light. So he creates with his words. He creates by speaking. If we take that and pair it with John 1-1, we hear about the Word of God. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, 5 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. So God speaks everything into creation, and John tells us that through him all things were made. He is the Word of God, and the Word of God was with God, and the Word was God. And it tells us that that Word was life and light. So God is creating through his words. He's making light. He's creating sustenance for mankind, and he makes life, birds and fish and land animals and people. But let's talk about some details. What specifically does God create on day one? The heavens and the earth. He says first, let there be light. light. So the first thing that he makes is light. Who is the light of the world? Jesus, right? Jesus is the light of the world. He is the word. Through him all things were made. God is speaking these things into existence. So we can look at day one. Of course, God makes visible light, but you can see that as the entrance of Jesus into the world. He came into the world as the light of the world. So think about day one having a theme of the life of Jesus. Does anybody know what happened on day two? The waters were parted, right? The waters above from the waters beneath. Um, so there's a separation on day two. Now, reading the account of creation, there's a pattern. God uh, says, let there be light. And God saw that it was good and there was evening and morning. And then God goes through the, the seven days of creation. At the end of each day, it says, and God saw that it was good. And God saw that it was good. He says that every day except day two. On day two, that phrase is missing. It does not say, and God saw that it was good on day two. So why is that missing from day two? Well, day two, you have a separation, waters above from the waters below. Um, and what is death but separation, right? Our death is the separation of the body and the spirit. The second death, is ultimate separation from God. So death is always some kind of separation. And think about Jesus on the cross. What did he cry out to God when he was on the cross? He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He could feel that separation. That was not a good day. It was the best day in all of history, but it was the worst day in all of history. The Son of God being crucified on the cross was the absolute worst possible thing that could happen. God's creation, what he made, turning on him and murdering him on the cross, worst possible thing. But God takes it and he turns it upside down and he makes it the best possible day. So at the end of the account of creation, 
God saw everything was very good, um, including day two. It just is missing on, on that particular day. So day one is light. Think about the life of Christ. Day two, it doesn't say that it's a good day. Think about the death of Jesus on the cross. But day three, what happens on day three? In fact, I'm just going to go to Genesis 1 and read what happens on day three. Okay. Make sure I get it right here. Verse um, 9. Thank you. Is that right? Yes. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place and let dry land appear. This is day three. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good and there was evening and morning the third day. So what happens on day three? Land, right? And vegetation. So this one says they were gathered, right? So on day two, that's what we're talking about. It was divided. On day three, God gathers the waters and he calls them the seas. So God gathers the waters. I always imagine him gathering the waters so that the dry land can appear. And on that dry land, we see the first vegetation beginning to grow. Fruit trees and herbs. Um, this begins to provide the sustenance that will be necessary for the animals and mankind that he creates later. So he's planning ahead. He gathers the waters together. He lets dry land appear. And then what do we see but the first ever first fruits, right? The fruit of the trees, the herb yielding seed. That is first fruits if I've ever seen it before. Let's consider um, some of the words um, from scripture. I skipped a verse, didn't I? Psalm twenty two fourteen. when Jesus was on the cross, Psalm twenty two fourteen says, I am poured out like water. All my bo bones are out of joint, and my heart is like wax, and it is melted within me. So think about Jesus being poured out like water. The Bible talks about waters that are poured out can't be gathered up again. The only one that can do that is God, right? The only one that can gather the waters together and make seas is God. Jesus was poured out like water on the cross. But God gathered him back together, gave him life, and moved the stone away, and he came out. And when he came out, you could say he was walking on dry land. Um, several times, Jesus talked about the sign of Jonah. In Jonah 2, chapter 10, am I going in order because I have a different copy? Yes. This is, okay. And the Lord commands the fish, and it vomited Jonah on dry land. Okay, so on the third day, we know Jonah was spat out on the third day. He'd been in the belly of the fish for three days. He spat out onto dry land. The third day, the dry land appears and you have first fruits, right? Jonah is spat out of the whale onto dry land. Just before he is spit out of the whale, he's saying this prayer and he says at the very end of it, salvation is of God. But if you look at that in Hebrew, he says, Yeshua ta la Yahweh. He says, Jesus is of God. Salvation in Hebrew is Yeshua. So Jonah says this prayer, Jesus is of God. And then he spat out onto dry land. He's delivered like Jesus is resurrected. And Matt, uh, Jesus refers to this in Matthew 12. But he answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. Jonah was spit out on the third day. Jesus came out of the tomb on the third day. Um, the first roots first appeared on day three of creation. So God had it planned from the beginning. So the sign of Jonah specifically references <coughs> him being spit out 
the on the third day. On yes, the third on day. the third day. So, and that's mentioned several times in, in different Gospels. The sign of Jonah <laughs> is he will be in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, and he will um, come out on the third day. He will resurrect on the third day. So that's the sign that he gave to the Pharisees. You know, another, they knew that. Mm -hmm, they did. Yes. And either they knew it and they understood it and they just fought against it because they didn't want it to be, or they didn't understand. Yeah. And they couldn't see it. And that's the same And thing. they were blind. Yeah. They either resist or I don't understand. Or I don't understand. Yeah. They didn't have the Holy Spirit like we do. Right. Right. Um, it's like the, the parable of the seeds. Sometimes the seed falls in good soil, you understand, and produce a crop. Sometimes the seed falls on rocky soil. You have a little root, but you dry up quickly. Sometimes the seed falls on uh, the pavement, and the birds take it away. They take the understanding away. So you, you don't understand, so you can't receive what you, you don't understand. Um, so that stuff's kind of hard to grapple with. Any other questions or comments to this point? Marty? I had a comment. Um, since God didn't create the moon until, what, the third day? Day four. Or day four. Mm -hmm. But on um, the first day, he created light. Yes. So he is the light. Right. There was light before he ever created the mm -hmm. sun. Yes. Correct. So the source of light is not the sun and the moon. It's something greater, something before the sun and the moon. Yeah. And when we go to heaven, there will be a sun and a moon. It'll be Jesus. It'll be the ultimate source of light. Yeah, absolutely. It's amazing. So let's talk about the importance of the third day. We're, we're talking about first fruits as the feast day given the third day after Passover. We've seen how that was an important day to the Israelites before they got into the land because the manna from heaven stopped on that day and they, they, eight of the first fruits of the land that year. Jesus came out of the grave. His earthly body was no longer. He was raised in a new spiritual body as an example for what will happen to his followers, the rest of his body. He's the head and we're the body. But he came out in a new form, in a resurrected uh, new spiritual body. But the third day is important. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, and how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So the question is, where in scripture does it say that Jesus would die, be buried, and resurrect on the third day? Well, we have a witness of it right here in type and shadow. Um, Jesus was the Passover lamb. He was the unleavened bread in the tomb, and he was the first fruits. The third day he came out from the grave. So Paul is delivering the gospel here. Here is the essential message of the gospel. Jesus died for our sins as the Passover lamb, according to the scriptures. He was buried. That means he was the unleavened bread. And he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. So Searching the scriptures, here are just a few examples of that phrase, third day. Of course, we've been talking fruit was formed on day three of creation. Um, in Genesis 22, the story of Abraham taking Isaac to Mount Moriah to offer him as a, a sacrifice. It says, Abraham lifted up his eyes and he saw the place from a distance and he saw the place of the sacrifice on the third day. So he's, I imagine him seeing into the future through the years, he's seeing the place of the sacrifice. He's thinking it's for Isaac, but no, eventually it's for the son of God on the third day. Pharaoh made a birthday feast on the third day and dealt with the butler and baker. Um, the butler and baker are a, a picture of the thieves that were on either side of Jesus. Moses told the people to be ready against the third day. That was the day that the Lord came down in a fiery, thunderous cloud on Mount Sinai. David hid himself from his enemy Saul on the third day, and he escaped his enemy. You could say Jesus escaped his enemies um, on the third day. Solomon made the wise judgment about dividing the baby who was born on the third day. 
Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord after being healed from his deadly sickness. The third day is mentioned there as well. Jonah was spat out onto dry ground on the third day. And Jesus turned water into wine at a marriage in Cana of Galilee on the third day. So lots of important things happen associated with that phrase third day. Now, if we want to get really specific, those are just the day after tomorrow type phrases. On the 17th of Nisan, on the day of first fruits, Several events are recorded in Scripture. Noah's Ark comes to rest on Mount Ararat on the third day. Now think about that. The earth was covered with water. Noah and his family were in the ark. The waters had been receding. And the ark comes to rest on dry land on the top of the mountain on Mount Ararat on the 17th of Nisan. Now, if you read that account, it's going to say the 17th day of the seventh month because that was before the calendar change. Remember at Passover, God said, this is going to be your new first month. It's the old seventh month, but now it's going to be the first month. So it's called the seventh month in Genesis, but it's the same as the new first month. So Noah's Ark comes to rest on Mount Ararat. Remember on day three, God gathers the waters and dry land appears. Well, what happens after the flood? The waters are receding and the tops of the mountains appear. And the ark, which is a type of Christ, we're safe in him from the destruction, the, the judgment, comes to rest on Mount Ararat. Um, now, the next one is shadowed in Scripture, but I can't find specific time clues that verify this. But this is just Jewish tradition that the Israelites pass through the Red Sea on dry ground. So they have their Passover they escape on the day of unleavened bread and then they travel and then on the day of first fruits they say that was the day of the parting of the Red Sea and they cross on dry land. It makes sense but I'm not 100% uh, able to verify dates in scripture. Manna from heaven ceases and the Israelites enjoy the first fruits of the land. And of course the day of first fruits is described on the 17th of Nisan. Esther's fast ends and she appears before the king. Um, so Esther goes in before the king and you weren't supposed to do that in Esther's day. You couldn't just appear before the king. So it's a, it's a picture of, of the resurrection of Jesus. And of course, the most important third day or 17th of Nisan was the day of first fruits when Jesus rose from the dead. Um, so all of that is amazing. All of it's there. If you're just sensitive to watch for that phrase third day, you can learn a lot about it. Now, the last thing I want to end with, you can take it or leave it. But I think it's fascinating, and this type of stuff gives me hope for our day. So we're going to talk about it. Um, how much time has transpired since Jesus was on the earth? Approximately. Around 2,000 years, right? Give or take a little, depending on when was he born, when did he die, what's the chronology there? We can say around 2,000 years. Second Peter 3.8 says, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. So it's only been two days since Jesus was on the earth, right? If we look from God's perspective, it says a thousand days to the Lord is like, or a thousand years is like a day in his sight. So what we see as 2,000 years with this conversion factor, we could say that's just two days in the Lord's sight. So keep that in mind. What has happened in, since 2,000 years ago for the nation of Israel that we've gotten to see in our lifetime? They became a nation. Again. They became a nation. They were in the belly of the whale, right? And for 2,000 years, they were in the diaspora to the ends of the earth, but they have come back into their land miraculously. Um, that's been about 2,000 years approximately. <coughs> And all of this, it ties into a, a prophecy in Hosea. Hosea 6.2 says, After two days, he will revive us. In the third day, he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. So the time factor there is day. But if we use thousand years, listen to this. After 2,000 years, he will revive us. In the third thousand year, he will raise us up. And that's exactly what's happened to the nation of Israel. That is incredible. So if it applies to the nation of Israel, how does it apply to the body of Christ? 
We are the body of Christ, all true believers, Jew, Gentile, man, woman, slave, free. It's all the same in the church. You, you all have equal status in the church. But look at John 2, verses 18 to 22. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. So he says, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it up in three days. And yes, that happened literally. They destroyed his temple of his body on Passover, Three days later, later, he was raised from the dead. But if we take the day as a thousand years and apply that to the body of Christ, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. In three thousand years I will raise it up. We know it applies on a small scale to Jesus himself, but Jesus calls the bride of Christ, the church, his body. And eventually we know that he will raise us up either from the grave or in the rapture. And it was early on the third day that he came out of the tomb. And if we, if we look at this alone, no, it's not um, predictive. It's not a formula for when is the rapture going to occur? When is the second coming going to occur? But in the context of our day and looking at the light of all of the events going on in the world and all of the signs that Jesus gave us in Matthew 24, we can see that day approaching. And so is it possible that that could apply not to just his singular body at the time of his death, burial, and resurrection, but could it ab apply to his body collectively that on the third day he will raise up his, his temple? It's those types of things that, that give me hope. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? And remember, he says, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Ephesians 5.30 for we are members of his body. And that is the ultimate blessed hope of the church, to be raised up like him who was the first fruits. So the first three feasts, the spring feasts, are now complete. The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, extremely significant, and something that I think everyone should know and just enjoy studying as a Christian. So questions or comments?